Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Attorney Wayne Cobb. I'm the senior partner of Cobb Council. I've filed uh, over 700 conservatorships, uh, and uh, we have done work with nonprofits, for profits, individuals, private residents, uh, working to establish the local rule here in Allegheny County. I look forward to having a discussion about conservatorships and how they can be a useful tool to deal with blight in your neighborhood. So I want to start off by saying that today's webinar, we're going to dig into the basics of Act 135 with the goal of helping you understand how you can use that tool. Um, there have been many policy discussions around Act 135 and possible amendments to the law, but for today's webinar, we're going to talk about using the law as it currently exists to address blighted properties. So I want to share some data that um, Judge Butchart in Philadelphia shared uh, last week during the bench bar conference in Philadelphia. Judge Butchart handles all of the Act 135 cases in Philadelphia. She said that in Philadelphia, they've had 656 conservatorship petitions since, since 2016. There's 134 pending petitions and 8% are less than 18 months old. They're generally resolved in two years. So in Philadelphia, there is abundant use of the tool in comparison to other counties. Wayne, how about, what are you seeing in Allegheny County? Well, I think that Allegheny County uh, is starting to use the tool much more. It took us a while um, after COVID to uh, kind of navigate the court system. There are, there have been over six judges assigned to deal with uh, conservatorship cases. Um, and so it's being used now, I think, by uh, a lot of folks who are trying to figure out ways to deal with problems in their neighborhoods. Whereas I think when it was first started, it was kind of used by one or two parties um, or one or two nonprofits, I should say, who were really trying to figure out, does it really work? Um, now I think it's being used more by business owners, nonprofits, and residents and individuals across the, the spectrum. Um, we did in 2022, really 2021, 2022, uh, provide uh, get provided with a conservatorship docket in Allegheny County, for example. So if you want to look up a case in Allegheny County, you can go CS-21 and then put in a number and you can see what was filed. Whereas prior to that, um, it was all lumped into the general docket. So they, they're trying to make it such that there's uh, some more systems in place to help folks who are either practitioners or people who are trying to use the law to kind of get through the court system in a more efficient manner. Great. And in other places besides Philadelphia and Allegheny counties, we've seen um, some use of the tool. Butler County Redevelopment Authority has used it. There have been some municipalities in Delaware County and Montgomery County who have tried to use the tool. So it is, and Schuylkill County was at the very beginning a user of, there were municipalities in Schuylkill County that used the tool. So it's a tool that can be used, and we'll get into this in more detail by municipalities as well as neighbors and others to address blighted property. So to start off, we just wanna say that at least my, from my perspective, that Act 135 is a powerful blight remediation tool. It really is um, one of those tools that is st when strategically used, it can really help to address a single property. So when you think of conservatorship, think of it as not designed for large scale revitalization, but for that one property that's a problem property where all other efforts have failed. I will say this, I do have clients that look at it for the purposes of like large scale um, in terms of in the midst of a large property assemblage. And so they'll go after two or three, or I'll have clients who are participating in a scattered site development. And so they'll go after properties through conservatorship in a scattered site, but most of those are usually nonprofit organizations. Yeah, and, and when you talk about those, Wayne, what would be the largest number of parcels in any one single conservatorship petition? And, uh, well, it depends because you're automatically restricted to whether or not the parcels are contiguous by the same owner. So if you have multiple properties you want to go after, um, but they're not owned by the same uh, owner, you can't go after them all in the same petition. And so that's a have separate petitions. Yeah. So you might have several petitions filed by one person or one entity, but there's some built in protections into the law to prevent the destruction or the abuse of the law where you try and put in, you know, a hundred properties because somebody thinks that their neighborhood has gone to hell, for example, you have yeah. to right way. 
So when we think about the act, we're looking at the act was initially passed in 2008, and then it was significantly amended in 2014. And that's a citation to uh, where you can find it in the law books. But here, the, the idea was to provide a mechanism to address these properties and return them to productive use to improve the quality of life for the neighbors. And here is another um, citation from the act itself. And for me, the idea is to, before the building deteriorates further, you want a stopgap method for preserving that housing use. Or again, it doesn't have to just be housing. It can be commercial or industrial, but it's to preserve that before the building deteriorates further. So what is conservatorship? It's a court process that is very important. It has to be started through a petition that's filed in your court of common pleas. And I'm going to ask Wayne to address more of that. But the court oversees the petition from start to completion. And the goal or the objective here is that the conservator gets possession of the property, not title, not ownership. At the beginning, the goal is possession of the property to remediate and repair the property. And uh, again, remember that it's not just the conservator, petitioner, and the judge. The owner is a party and may participate fully in the proceedings. Wayne, what would you like to add here before we get into the nitty gritty? Well, I would just say that with regards to the conservatorship, I always like to tell my clients that if you're filing a petition and the petition is filed correctly, then you would have already met the conditions for a finding of blight, right? If you are dealing with um, a, a property and you're not sure, you should ask your attorney, you know, does this meet the qualifications? Because that will save you a lot of wasted money trying to file a petition on something that you probably weren't going to get in the first place. It's pretty clear when a property is going to be uh, identified as being blighted because it has to be found to be blighted first. And then we determine whether it's going to go into conservatorship. But the first thing we have to do is decide, is this a blighted property we're dealing with? And Act 135 is very specific in what the petition has to include. And we're going to cover some of that. But First, let's talk about why conservatorship. First of all, some municipalities are using conservatorship because it motivates owners to bring a property into compliance. They've tried code violations. They've tried going to court, to the DMJ, and none of that has worked. They've tried negotiating, and the owner is just ignoring the municipal government that's seeking compliance. Because with most code enforcement, the goal is voluntary compliance, right? Municipalities don't want to be chasing after property owners to get them to comply. So conservatorship is often used to motivate owners to bring the property into compliance. Secondly, um, it provides an alternative to eminent domain. Some uh, communities are not comfortable using eminent domain to acquire blighted properties. They may not have a redevelopment authority or the resources to do that. So conservatorship is an alternative to eminent domain to return blighted properties to productive use. And then finally, um, most of the time, it's municipalities that have the right to pursue code enforcement issues and property maintenance code violations. But conservatorship expands the parties that are able to do something when all else has failed. And it allows neighbors, CDCs, nonprofits, and local developers to work together or to work individually to address these blighted properties. Wayne? Well, you know, I think that what's really interesting about why conservatorship is used for either the uh, motivation of owners or local governments and or neighbors is it's something that's designed to get the attention of the property owner. Like at its root, you are trying to get the property owner's attention. And I think that when you have uh, neighbors and CDCs or nonprofits and for-profits working together, trying to address a community plan, most neighborhoods that have an active CDC that's really trying to do its job. You guys have a neighborhood plan, right? Or a regional plan. You really want to figure out what's the best way to try and get this property under control. And in Pennsylvania, if you have someone who's passed away, unless there's been an estate that's been established, you really can't transfer that property outside of a uh, tax sale or you know some kind of foreclosure with a mortgage. But we've seen a lot of, uh, we like to call them zombie properties, where the bank has foreclosed and nobody's going to do anything because they don't want to pay the taxes on it. So they're just sitting there decaying. So, you know, conservatorship is a good tool to deal with that. Great. 
So when we start talking about the details of conservatorship, keep in mind these five categories to consider as we go through the discussion. One, you have the petitioner who's going to file the petition in court. You have the subject property. You have the owner of the subject property. You have a conservator if one is appointed. And then you have the court overseeing all of these parties and entities as they pursue um, this petition. So as we get started, let's talk about first the petitioner. Under the statute, the petitioner has to be defined within the realm of an interested party. So it's the lien holders. Anybody who is owed any money um, on this property or holds any liens on the property, secured creditor of the owner is uh, an interested party. Resident or business owner within 200 navigable feet, a nonprofit corporation, including a redevelopment authority, they have to be located in the municipality where the building's located. In Philly, the nonprofit or RDA must have also participated in a project within a five mile radius of the building. Municipalities and school districts can also file petitions and recently amended, uh, the law was recently amended to allow land banks to also be petitioners. Wayne, do you wanna talk a little bit about the navigable feet and how that decision came about? Yeah, certainly. But I, I wanted to say something. Um, so the previous slide has five and I was going to, I was toying with it, but I was like, no, it's going to be too far into the weeds, but you could really throw a sixth one in there, which is uh, interested party, which um, even though the petitioner is an interested party, the way this statute's written, it's almost like a, if you wanted to give it a, a little phrase, it would be a, I'm sick of this, right? <laughs> because the I'm sick of this statute, because any resident or business owner which, who's within 2,000 feet, that's that's a whole neighborhood, really, right? And if, the, and if they're sick of a house, they can go to the court and say, I'm sick of this. I want to take possession to fix it. Now, we were always trying to figure out, those of us who practice, we're trying to figure out, what is this 2,000 feet? Um, the statute does not say navigable 2,000 feet. However, there was a court case that just came down where the question that was posed to the court was, uh, should we measure it as the crow flies in terms of from point A to point B on a property? So you have to have a property that qualifies you to be within a 2,000 feet. So if you are at 123 Sycamore Lane and you're sick of 567 Sycamore Lane, if 567 Sycamore Lane is within 2,000 feet of you, you can go after it. The way that you measured that prior to a recent court case was you could drop a line on Google Maps and draw another line there and if Google Maps would literally calculate, this is gonna be 1500 feet. Well, what the Superior Court said was, not so fast, my friend. What you need to be able to do is walk to that property. And if it's 2000 feet walking or driving, then yes, you as a resident or business owner can go after that property as a petitioner. This doesn't apply to nonprofit corporations who are outside of Philadelphia because Philadelphia has a, a five mile restriction. If you're outside of Philadelphia, then you are operating and you're operating within a county where the property is located, then the statute permits you to go after any uh, blighted property, et cetera, that would qualify as falling within the conservatorship statute. Great. So let's get a little bit into the weeds on the subject property and what uh, conditions have to be present on a, on a property that can be subject of a conservatorship petition. Again, keep in mind the property can be residential, commercial, industrial, or a vacant lot. If it's a vacant lot, a structure must have been formerly on the property. So Wayne, do you want to talk a little bit about property eligibility and what's required to be shown in the petition in order to get to the next stage, which would be a hearing? Well, I think that the barriers are very, very, very low, right? So uh, first and foremost, uh, just like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, blight is in the eye of the seer, okay? It's not difficult to identify what is blighted and what's not blighted. However, these first four um, are really, really, really important, right? So if you are dealing with a property that's been legally occupied prior to 12 months, prior to you filing a petition, you can't go after that property, right? And so that means, and I think the statute inherently um, has this piece in there that says that the person who's going after the property has been monitoring it. They're a part of the community. They know what's going on. If you haven't been monitoring that property for the pri previous 12 months, then you can't really testify or attest to the fact that it hasn't been legally occupied. 
for the previous 12 months. And I've had several cases where we've had to be able, we've been able to defend and intervene and defend against speculators who were going after properties, but we were able to prove that it was legally occupied within 12 months. Um, the 60 day marketing, that's the same thing where you have people who are monitoring the MLS website, monitoring publicly available uh, websites to see, is this house for sold, uh, for sale? If it's not been monitored, you can't really tell that. Um, and and the, the foreclosure is no pending foreclosure actions. And so we've had litigation as to what a pending foreclosure means. But literally, if you do a title report and you see that there's a foreclosure action, walk away from that property. I would not advise that anybody go after that property because the bank is already going to do the work once they foreclose. And there's case law that states that if the bank already has an interest in it, then it's more likely than not that property will be rehabilitated. And that's the whole purpose. It's not about transferring title. It's about bringing it back to productive reuse. And then finally, I think that the other piece is with regards to three out of nine, um, it's here, public nuisance, needs substantial rehab, unfit, increased fire, subject to entry. It's only three. So that's a really, really, really low barrier. Um, I think that the key is how does the property look? Right. So if you can establish the initial four, right, the property hasn't been bought or sold within a previous six months, no foreclosure, property is not actively for sale, it hasn't been legally occupied. What's it look like? What are we talking about here? Right. And so the one thing I will say is if it's a vacant lot, you have to be able to prove that there was a building on that property um, prior to it becoming demolished. Um, so if there was a vacant lot and there was a building on it prior, you, you, you met the requirements. If it's a building that's overgrown, you can clearly see that it's affecting the economic value. You're going to meet the requirements. This part is easy to meet. That's why you have to make sure that if you're identifying properties that are going to be blighted, you do your, your groundwork and make sure you know what it looks like. Um, so that's what I would say. You had mentioned, um, Wayne, the, that it's really a, we got to take care of this together as a group. Like there's met multiple parties involved. Could you talk a little bit about intervention and if you ever represented folks that wanted to intervene as interested parties in conservatorship cases? Oh, absolutely. So interventions occur uh, a lot in Allegheny County, I would say. And the reason for that is most neighborhoods, um, and not just Allegheny County, but most neighborhoods, when you start to get down past the municipal level um, from the county standpoint and you start getting into the weeds, they know which properties they have identified as are not paying taxes, the properties are overgrown, et cetera. What you have is many times you'll have a borough or you'll have a CDC who doesn't have the funds to necessarily go after a property, but they're bringing it to the level of speech because they know or they have a group that's in the community that's saying, hey, we can't deal with this anymore. There's rats, infestation, we have ticks, fleas, mice. And so they'll work with another nonprofit organization or for-profit entity that's a developer that's well known to the local borough, that's well known to the code enforcement officer and say, hey, listen, can you guys deal with this? And so many times I've had cases where the uh, CDC or the borough will be the petitioner because the petitioner doesn't have to be the conservator. They'll be the petitioner to get standing and then they will collaborate with the potential conservator and they'll come in to show support for that conservator at the hearing to testify to the work that that potential conservator has already done in that neighborhood or in that community. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, one of the big questions that we talked about when we were preparing for this is like, what's necessary to create a successful conservatorship? That's like, like what do you see as the real basic uh, needs for creating that successful conservatorship? You talked about what the property looks like. So your petition would include, I would guess, photographs and other evidence of, of what the property looks like. What else is in that packet that's gonna kick off your conservatorship petition? Yeah, so I think that when I address this question, I take it from a bird's eye view. Um, and I think that your perspective images your obstacles. What I found is that it's about the mission of the project um, that creates a successful conservatorship. And the reason I say that is for a developer, a developer's really that I've dealt with, the developers I've dealt with, and I've dealt with dozens, they really care about the time and the money that they're spending 
on this project, right? Because money is limited, time is limited, and they don't have a lot of time to go from point A to point B. And it might be a part of a larger package. I think that a successful conservatorship for a nonprofit, um, time may not be a motivator because they've been sitting here watching this property for some time, but community results is the priority. And so when they get the result that they can take back to the community, they have obtained a successful conservatorship action. I think with government, the problem property is hey, they're not paying taxes. So what do we need to do? They're, they're <laughs> causing us to have to go out and cut their grass. So we're leaning and we're not getting money. Or we have to go and do another demo on another property. So their issue is public health and safety. And so they see a, a successful conservatorship as removing the problem property in its entirety. Um, and then I think with the neighbors that I represented, the successful cons conservatorship has been created by the issue being resolved. Right. I've had neighbors where and clients who've had children um, who are walking by the properties and there's broken glass, there's attractive nuisance. They've had dogs where the property is falling into their backyard, the dogs eating, you know, pieces of the roof and, and playing around with the siding that's flying into their uh, property. So their issue is more. How can I make sure that my block is actually safe. I'm tired of this. So a successful conservatorship, um, you have to understand why you're doing it. If you forget why you're doing it or lose sight of why you're doing it, then it literally becomes a quagmire. Um, a successful conservatorship, you have to understand whether or not you have the funds. Where do you need to stop? If you don't know where you need to stop before you start, you're going to have an unsuccessful conservatorship because you need to understand how to offload Right. So you need to know whether you're going to stabilize the property or whether you truly want to rehabilitate the property. You need to understand how much is this going to cost me and what lines of credit do I have? Right. Do I already have uh, government financing lined up from trying to partner or am I going in trying to figure out we just need to get site control? And so when you can answer those questions, you can know whether you're being successful in your legal action, because at the end of the day, it's still a legal action and you can jump off at multiple points at any time, but you need to know, was the money I spent well spent? Great. So talk a little bit about, and I'm gonna just talk for a second about a conservator. Like the conservator is appointed by the court, again, to take possession, not ownership. They have to have the capacity to take possession, effectuate rehab and manage the conservatorship process. But as Wayne just said, maybe it's just to stabilize and then to, make it safe and do basic renovations to clear that hurdle and then move it um, out of the conservatorship process. Again, the senior lien holder has first consideration as conservator, then a nonprofit organization or other competent entity. So the, the petition has to recite that the senior lien holder was asked and declined or that there has to be some other representation about the senior lien holder not wanting to be the conservator. The liabilities for the property remain with the owner and are not imposed on the conservator. That's very important. Like the environmental liabilities and any taxes owed, they stay with the owner of the property. But the, the last point is the one to remember. The conservator uses their own funds to remediate the property. And the idea is that that conservator is either going to be reimbursed by the owner or proceeds from the sale of the property. So um, it's there's risk involved for those conservators that are putting their own dollars out to bring this property back to a state where uh, it can be uh, not held as unsafe or not able to be occupied and it can be removed from that list and brought back into uh, productive use. So the next question, Wayne, when you think about a conservator, describe for us what like a conservator, a typical conservator is. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as a typical conservator, but I do <laughs> want to hit this point um, with regards to those funds, because I think funds is a really important issue. Um, so there are certain banks that do create um, actual uh, funding instruments for conservatorship. You don't actually have to use your own funds. You're using funds that you have either obtained or you have applied for. So I've had clients who are using funds from um, state government. I have funds, uh, clients who are using funds that came from uh, the federal government. I've had clients who use funds that come from the local city government. I've had clients who are using uh, funds from private lenders 
right? The key about the conservatorship action is you want to be able to get those funds via court order at some point put as a senior non-governmental lien holder, right? So the, the beautiful thing about the statute is there's a lot of flexibility, which means that it can also be open to a lot of abuse. And so uh, I'm going to get to this typical conservator, but I really want to hit this point. So with regards to the funding piece, 68 PS 1108 allows for any funding that's obtained for the purpose of renovating or remediating the property through conservatorship to get senior non-governmental lien holder status. And it also provides that that particular mortgage, which is usually it's placed as a mortgage, can never be wiped out until it's paid. And so that gives the banks that finance or the governmental entity, whether it's a usually a redevelopment authority um, or a private lender, the um, assurity that regardless of what happens, like the relationship between the lender and the conservator goes bad, guess what? Their funds are still protected. And I think that's really important. The conservators that I've dealt with, um, have they, they have evolved. Um, I've been doing this since 2014. And it started with uh, Pittsburgh Community Reinvestment Group. Uh, who was actually working with neighbors in the local neighborhood of Sheridan, which is a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh. And they were doing all the covering for the fees, but they were trying to figure out who needs to help. So it went from just neighbors to nonprofits who were trying to bundle properties in order to get um, large properties and areas covered for uh, federal grants. And they had to deal with specific properties that they, they had made deals with the owners and when they ran the title report, it turned out the owner hadn't been honest. Um, it then started to deal with local uh, business owners who were in real estate. And the way that they, when they looked at the map, they saw that, you know what, I actually have large plots of land that I own that's almost, I'm responsible for the corridors, but then there's nothing for my um, clients, which would have been their tenants, to use for green space. So they were taking space properties that were blighted and tearing them down and making them green space, community gardens, dog parks, um, and trying to create amenities. I then saw that it started to develop into people who were for-profit, who were tired of fighting at city treasurer cells, right? And so they were like, hey, let's go after this. But they all had you know, dozens of properties in their neighborhoods. We then saw that the typical conservator kind of evolved into the neighbor who was trying to protect their value and their investment. And that really started to happen around uh, uh, COVID actually, when people were staying at home and they were, I guess they were just looking out and were like, wait a minute, what's going on with my neighborhood? So I don't know what the correlation there is, but, um, and then I think that right now, um, the typical conservator includes all those, but we also see that we have local government which is working with uh, nonprofits where they identify a certain nonprofit, at least out here in Allegheny County, uh, they'll say, hey, listen, this particular nonprofit, I'm almost certifying it because they've worked with us and we want them to be the entity that deals with blighted properties in this area. And the reason that they do that is because they have the ability to, I think, exert soft control where they trust the developer, they trust the developments that they've done. They know they're not trying to take advantage of the neighborhood. They know they're going to be a good taxpayer because they've been paying taxes. And they know that that particular developer has skin in the game. So I think it's it's evolved in that manner. So Great. So let's talk a little bit about the court's role in conservatorship. Again, it's a court process. You have to file a petition that meets the requirements stated in Act 135. The court reviews the petition and issues an order to show cause, and there's a hearing scheduled. Under the statute, it says the hearings to be held within 60 days. You'll hear about um, the delays and the fact that 60 days isn't always the timeline because of, of delays with service. All owners, lien holders, and others have to receive notice. And then again, the statute provides that a decision needs to be issued within 30 days of the hearing. Um, the court reviews and considers um, the final plan for the property. It also will review any applications to sell the property. And then finally, the court will approve the sale of the property and then the final accounting and any distribution of proceeds. Um, Wayne, when you're in court, what what the, what are the judges looking for and what role have you seen judges play in um, Allegheny County with respect to these petitions? 
Yeah. So, and I've, I've been in counties outside of Allegheny County as well. And I will say that every judge hews very closely to the statute. I think that I, that it depends on um, the judge's understanding of how to interpret statutes sometimes. And the only reason I say that is because um, once you get in a court, you will most likely um, have the ability to uh, be successful. Um, and again, it goes to what success is, but you, I have judges who will uh, really want to know, is there a way to settle this, right? Go outside before we start a hearing, let's figure out if there's a way to settle this. But that's usually when there's an owner involved, right? If there's no owner involved, the big key for judges, which I really appreciate, is them making sure that we did our job to provide proper service. And that's really important because if you want to sell the property or if the property is sold out of conservatorship, you want to be able to get title insurance. And you can't get title insurance if you can't prove service, right? And so um, we've, we've had to really, I think that's the greatest uh, gray area for petitioners, um, not understanding what alternative service means. Uh, I think that conservatorship stack, the statute itself for us really starts at alternative service. So it's a double layer of alternative service. And that literally just means that it's not served by a, a sheriff outside of Philly, right? So it's not served by a sheriff. It's served by certified mail, right? So that's, that's unusual in and of itself. And so I think that opens up uh, a lot of cans of worms because you really have to rely on the environments that the attorney is doing the right thing when they say that they're serving. So I think that the judge is um, literally the bulwark. The way I explain to my clients is this, the property sits in the hands of the judge and the conservator becomes the judge's feet and does the work. So the conservator is responsible to tell the judge who is literally their boss because he's saying, his, okay, I believe this property is blighted um, based on what you've told me, but I'm, the judge is not gonna get out there and give any money or, or pick up a shovel or, or hammer a nail. So he authorizes that person that came in front of him to do those things. But that person is now responsible and has a duty to tell the judge, hey, what are you doing? And how are you getting it done? And with what funds are you getting it done? And I'll say this, the statute's really, really flexible because at the hearing for conservatorship, you can actually bundle in your final plan. I've seen some judges who say, you know what? Even if the statute allows that, I'm not gonna do that because I want everybody that could be a party in interest to come on in and tell us, do they agree with this? So post that plan on the docket so that we can actually see what's going on after you've had time to walk through the property. So usually when we have our final plan hearings, um, depending on the type of property, like if it's a vacant lot and we know we're gonna landscape, we try and truncate it. But if it's a building and my client hasn't been through the building, which they shouldn't be in the building anyway, then we're gonna have that final plan of abatement hearing. The other thing I'll say is, um, in Allegheny County, uh, we've seen the evolution of judges making sh forcing transparency, right? So forcing a disclosure statement where when you file for the application to sell, you also 30 days in advance say, A, what do you plan on doing with this property? B, how much money have you spent on the property? C, tell us everything else that we need to know. What evidence are you bringing to the hearing so that folks can see in advance what it is? Because it's a transparent process. It's the neighbors empowering you to do what you're going to do because they don't jump in as parties and interests. So they're they're implicitly empowering you to handle your business on that property. It's the courts empowering you as the conservator to handle your business and to bring them back a product. And I think, you know, we don't always think about the owner, but it's the owner who knows. Well, I've had owners who are like, listen, I can't do anything with it. So they're actually trusting that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. For the folks who have passed away, you know, they're absentee. They really still have a voice, but, you know, we, we move on without them. The, um, the owner's rights have been a major issue in some parts of the Commonwealth to make sure that there isn't um, abuse of the process at the, to the detriment of folks that have ownership interest in the property. So under the statute, um, in addition to service, you mentioned in Philadelphia, Philadelphia has a general court rule that um, follows the, um, the statute, but most lawyers here are in Philadelphia are, are personally serving the petitions and all the interested parties because of that need for title insurance. So here, the rights of the owners briefly are notice, full participation in the litigation, 
Um, as, as Wayne mentioned, most judges are going to want to try to see if at the start of all this, there's an opportunity to settle. Because a lot of times it's, if there's an owner involved, you want to be able to settle at the beginning before a lot of costs are incurred that would, again, deplete whatever remaining equity the owner might have in the property or would somehow impact the owner's ability to um, come in and ask for conditional relief. So the next is conditional relief. Conditional relief allows the owner to abate the code violations in a reasonable amount of time under the court supervision. So an owner can come to the hearing and say, I want conditional relief, and the court can come up with uh, an order that will allow for that that provides for, again, the court's supervision of the owner's uh, fixing up of the property or addressing issues that are outstanding. In addition, as the conservatorship proceeds, the owner can step in at any time to terminate conservatorship, but they must reimburse the petitioner and the conservator for all costs incurred Plus there's a conservator's fee and the, the details of that are spelled out on um, this slide. And then um, you look about, you talk about what the right uh, to sell the property and how that would work out. And I'm gonna ask Wayne to weigh in here on the owner's rights and what you've seen in uh, the counties where you've worked in terms of owner's participation. I think that's the next slide actually to talk about yes, uh, yes. the owner's involvement. So usually it's not that great, but when owners come in, um, they are given the opportunity to proceed. All right. And I actually prefer when owners arrive because number one, that proves that we did our job, right? You can't say that you didn't get service. Um, but I've seen it happen where the my client was just trying to bring the owner to court. And so once the owner shows up, they're able to do some kind of settlement, some kind of agreement. Uh, I think that um, when the owner is involved in participating, Sometimes we'll just allow them to do conditional relief, and that will be kind of almost like the consent decree, and they have to do it within so many months. And then if they don't, my client gets the property as the conservator. I think the big thing there is the cost, right? Um, the, the judges here have not budged on the cost, which my client will be entitled to if the owner does show up, because literally, if we hadn't filed the conservatorship action, the owner wouldn't be there. So that's um, what I would have to say about the owners participating. Great. And how about the rights and duties does the conservator have? They have the right to possess. They don't own or have hold title or take on the liabilities. They can borrow money. As Wayne mentioned, you can seek senior lien holder status that allows your bank or lender or other party that puts money into the property to feel some, um, some uh, risk aversion there. Um, they have to maintain, safeguard, and insure the building. They have to report to the court regularly. And at the end, there has to be a full accounting of all the income and expenditures. They have to implement the final plan. And then um, if selling the building is the, the end result, they have to uh, you know, manage that process as well. What can the conservator do? Um, the conservator needs to stabilize, rehabilitate, or demolish the property. They can obtain financing, obtain insurance, and enter into contracts, and then they can petition to sell the property. Um, talk a little bit about the sale of properties or how, how you've handled um, the, the, the final... Uh, actually, let me back up for a second and, and ask you to talk a little bit more about the due diligence and what's involved with getting building your case and being prepared to demonstrate to the court that you're eligible and should be have this conservator appointed? Yeah, so I think it's very important, depending on who you are. So if you're an individual or a business owner, you need to be able to provide the address that you are using, the qualifying address, and then you need to be able to uh, prove that you are going to be within 2,000 feet of the address that you're seeking to take. If you're a nonprofit, for example, I think as a fundamental uh, component, I think that you should have a resolution from your board of directors that says, we authorize this particular uh, property to be taken into conservatorship. That that covers you, um, I, I think. I think that you need to get a title report, right? You need to do your work to try and track down all the owners. The title report is the single most important thing that you do in a conservatorship. 
If you don't do a title report, a, a real title report, not somebody who says they know how to do a title report and goes down to the courthouse looking for you and then comes back and says, yeah, Rick, no, no, no. Get a real title report done and, and then do the work, right? So you need to be able to pull liens. You need to be able to track down owners as best you can. Sometimes you might have to hire, you know, somebody who does that work for you. Uh, I know we have. Um, you have to make sure that the property is eligible to the best that you can. If you're a nonprofit and you're not really familiar because you haven't been watching this property for 12 months, talk to the neighbors, right? Whether you're nonprofit or for-profit, talk to the neighborhood and see what is the condition. Ask folks, what do they want done with this property, right? Sometimes the go it alone method is the worst method because you'll have people show up because you have to post the property anyway. You have to post a notice of filing and they'll say, well, what is this? I was thinking about doing something with this property. Well, you should have done your homework. Go talk to their neighbors. That's very important. That's a community thing. Um, you don't necessarily have to take photographs, but photos speak a thousand words. I think that sometimes the code violation thing won't work for you because in, in most boroughs, unless somebody reports in, the code enforcement officer doesn't have the time to walk around to look and cite. Right. So you just have to be careful of that. But that's not a requirement for going into conservatorship. Just like if a property owner has been paying taxes, that doesn't disqualify it. I've had several properties that have paid a lot of taxes and the properties are hoarder houses and the owners were using it as a way to get a second soft mortgage on whatever they were living on and they were living off the mortgage. So, you know, I think that with regards to your qualifications, um, as long as you meet the party and interest, then you're pretty much covered with the conservator conservatorship qualifications. I will say this, um, a, a local government or an authority, uh, that's an 800 pound gorilla in the room. If you decide to file a conservatorship action, it's going to be kind of hard for anybody to say no uh, when you get into court. I mean, you just come in with great credibility. You can see credibility start to wane as it gets down to pass a nonprofit, to the for-profit, to the neighbor. And that's where you start to look at well, what is your connectivity to the property? If you're the next door neighbor, oh my goodness, you've been impacted, right? How can you argue against that? Um, and so the final thing I'll say about this is you don't actually have to have funding to file a conservatorship. What you have to have is the ability to demonstrate to the court that you can get the funding, right? And the court, I think the courts care about that because they don't want things languishing because you ran out of money and you didn't do your due diligence. Great. I want to skip this because we're getting close and I want to get to the case studies. So, um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about this slide and how you wrap up a conservatorship. Um, and, and I'll pass it back to you, Wayne, to talk a little bit about that. Oh, excellent. So a conservatorship is uh, that's governed under 68 PS 1109. Um, the owner who participates or who comes out the woodwork can always sell their property. But if they sell, it's subject to the conservatorship. And that's something very important to keep in mind because when it's subject to the conservatorship, you're entitled to 20% of the sales price or 20% of the costs that have been expended in the conservatorship, whichever is greater, or $2,500. Um, so the owner has, the owner is never dispossessed of title. That's very important. The owner always holds title to the property. Okay. So they can always come in and say, Your Honor, I want to sell it. And that's perfectly fine. Um, the conservator can sell the property, right? They have to, they go and hire a real estate broker or sell it themselves. But again, that's going to be subject to the court. They need to be able to come into court, explain who's buying it. And the court will want to ask questions of the potential um, buyer to make sure that they will not allow the property to go back into uh, a disrepair state. There is the opportunity to settle the case outside of court which is where you will pull the petition and there'll be a settlement agreement. And I think that's really important. Um, the final thing I'll say about statutory termination is the Superior Court came out with a case that stated that you can't just withdraw a case after you've been appointed as conservator and it's a settlement agreement. And you say, hey, you know what, we're done. The, the judge actually has to enter an order that says the case has come to an end. And Allegheny County, uh, one of the things that we use is methods to try and be as flexible as possible if the owner is involved in my cases, right? So we need to make sure that the owner is either A, compensated or the owner gets the property, my client is compensated. So, you know, there's different ways to work around terminating a, conservator a conservatorship. All right, and just some case studies and then we'll get to the questions. So. Uh, here's an example of a municipal petitioner. In this case, 
is renowned, especially in the municipal government side, um, in Cole Township and Shemokin, there were one family owned all these properties and they were great at eluding service. It took years and years and years of trying to get them served. And then conservatorship petitions were filed. And as you can see, um, by the end of uh, 2017, or most of the properties had been um, authorized for sale. Um, at a recent um, gathering, the uh, Redevelopment Authority or the Housing Authority director there spoke of this case and said that there was still one property that was still in the court under the court supervision, but all the others, most of the others have been sold to neighbors as side yards, which is common where a municipality um, leads the conservatorship petition and the property needs to be demolished. It's usually then sold as a side yard. This next one is another great example from the city of Bethlehem. It's the Goodman Theater. This petition was filed in October, 2016, and the conservatorship was granted. There was an unresponsive owner with a long history of violations. Um, the owner wound up representing himself and the court case just continued and continued. There's a lot of really great um, decisions, um, court opinions in this case that have helped to build out what conservatorship law means and how to bring your case. So that litigation has really helped to build out the statute itself. Um, but again, a long period of litigation with a litigious owner. Um, a nonprofit petitioner. This was one of my favorites from Philadelphia where um, the neighborhood CDC filed the petition and conserved the historic Robert Purvis house in Philadelphia's Spring Garden neighborhood. Uh, Robert Purvis was a, um, he, his house was a stop on the Underground Railroad, and the property is designated, in Phil, it's listed in Philly as part of the Register of Historic Places, and um, the, it took years and years of litigation, but still no, no resolution. Um, so the neighbors and the CDC got together, and now the property has been sold, it was sold for $455,000 and it's going to be redeveloped. The, there's a five unit multifamily residential building being built there. The zoning permit was last issued. The last time I looked at this, it was in November of 2023, the building permits were issued. And, and this historic structure is being, um, being preserved. So here, I'll let you speak of, of, of these uh, in East Liberty, Wayne, I'll pass it over to you. Whereas I just use one case study because I figured by the time we were here, we'd be racing day to the end. Um, this particular property, I highlight this because um, it was a partnership uh, between public and private. So the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh issued a RFP for a scattered site proposal. And this particular property was in a horrible state of disrepair. If you can go to the next slide. Sure. At the end of the day, they removed the tree. They built something from the ground up, right? And, and that's actually unusual. I don't really have too many cases where people demolish something and then put something brand new unless they're working with uh, a, the URA or redevelopment authority or they're working with the housing authority um, where they are trying to literally build something either from the ground up or doing a full gut renovation or total rehabilitation uh, for the purposes of affordable housing. And I would say that affordable housing is probably one of the number one drivers of nonprofits uh, doing conservatorships out here. Yeah. So here for, for me, and, and these really reflect my thinking on conservatorship and what makes it an effective tool. It's flexible and relatively inexpensive to use. I'll, I'll use those terms. Um, and again, it motivates owners to comply. It's an alternative. Um, nonprofits and developers like it because they can get site control more quickly and move ahead expeditiously with stabilization and then improving the property. And then the last piece is Wayne mentioned, properties don't have to be tax delinquent to be eligible for conservatorship. So a lot of land banks and municipalities, they have to wait until there's tax foreclosure really as, 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 the, as the path for them to potentially acquire a property. But with conservatorship, the properties don't have to be tax delinquent. And then finally, before we get to some questions, I'm just going to briefly talk about challenges and limitations. Wayne mentioned funding and how there's opportunities in Allegheny County where I've seen in other parts of the Commonwealth funding and access to dollars to do conservatorships have not been as easy to 
uh, to get in place. Um, some municipalities and redevelopment authorities have access to the state and federal dollars and local dollars that um, are government uh, based. The other and other challenges are notice and service of process. The length of the process can be um, daunting. Um, and if you're bringing the first conservatorship case in your county, um, you want to make sure that you really have a uh, uh, a great case as the first case there because it's going to be new to the judges and the court personnel. So you're going to want to have a case that really shows a blighted property and all of those things that contribute to a successful conservatorship case. Um, the other thing is incentivizing private investors to get involved because again, there aren't enough public dollars to address blighted property. So the 2014 amendments were really intended to um, incentivize private investors with the conservator's fee, uh, which some have argued is too high and there's efforts underway to figure out better ways to include that conservator slash developer's fee in the statute. And then lastly, one of the challenges is protecting property owners from those overzealous private developers that are using conservatorship. And again, the courts supervise this, but when you receive a petition or some court filing and you're um, an owner of property that's blighted, that's upsetting and unnerving and emotional. So if there's a way to educate and protect property owners from these uh, those overzealous developers that don't often bring um, good cases, um, then, then the court wants to look at that and interested in hearing more from others about opportunities to do that. So here's, in, the slides will come around, but here's just some additional resources that I wanted to share as part of this group. I'm going to end my screen share and then get to the Q and A. Let me see how I can stop my share. Okay, and I'm gonna pull up the Q and A. Let me see where I do that, down here, okay. Q and A. All right, I'm gonna start at the beginning and I'll throw it out to um, you, Wayne. How often does the senior lien holder accept conservatorship if another interested party brings the action? I've never had an experience where the senior lien holder has accepted um, the conservatorship um, because usually the senior non-governmental lien holder is a bank and they don't want to be appointed as conservator. I've had them show up to try to make sure that their lien is not stricken. Um, but uh, in those instances, the initial hearing is not about striking liens. It's literally about trying to put the property into uh, conservatorship. Talk a little bit about the one thing that I like about conservatorship, too, is when you get to that final accounting, the taxes that are owed on the property are are above the conservators lien. So they so municipalities and school districts that um, are located where the property is, they wind up getting delinquent taxes paid as part of the conservatorship process. So that's a benefit, too, for places where they're scrambling to try to recover these delinquent taxes. So. I wanted to mention that too. Okay, next question. Let's say, okay, what are the possible, go ahead, Wayne. I'll say sometimes, right? Sometimes the, there'll be taxes paid. Some, and it depends on the kind of sale, right? If it's a sale to a third party um, where the there's a lot of money and proceeds, sometimes they'll be able to pay all the taxes. Sometimes they can't pay all the taxes. And right. then I have places where the municipalities will will go back to the date of when the conservatorship was actually filed and say, hey, can we just get this amount of taxes? Because they know that moving forward, you're going to get paid. But some of these properties have been delinquent for 20 years, right? And there's no liability that transfers to the conservator. And so you see a lot of flexibility, especially when it's a local government entity or a quasi-government entity that's bringing the petition or that's heavily involved in the petition, or if it's a very uh, profitable, uh, reputable nonprofit, who everybody knows is not out here trying to make it a quick buck where the, you know, the taxes can be uh, talked about and resolved in a manner that all the parties feel like they want something. Right. Okay. Next question is, which is a, is a complicated question. What are the possible fair housing implications against protected classes who face financial and government related barriers to address blighted properties? I will start by saying that at the bench bar conference, there was discussion about, um, what do we do to help those owners who face the financial and government related barriers that can't help them and, and pro prohibit them from maintaining their properties? So first off, it's like they own the property. So 
owners of properties are accountable for the condition of the properties. Having said that, that's easy to say, right? But there is a, um, there are barriers, there are economic barriers, there are financial barriers. So what resources are out there to help owners who have blighted properties be able to uh, address those blighting conditions? One problem is that the property is not their, their home, right? So they're not living there. So many of the programs that are available uh, for homeowner repairs are limited to the where they live. So this um, property that's subject to conservatorship perhaps is an asset. So they can't access the legal services for folks that don't have any assets or have limited assets, but they still don't have money available to pay for rehabbing these properties. So my answer is I don't know um, what there is out there, but I would really support looking into statewide opportunities, funding to help owners of blighted property subject to conservatorship be able to fund some of the work and, and keep some of their equity. Wayne? I would say that the most important uh, resource is telling that owner to show up to court. Right. Um, that's number one. The second thing I would say is, you know, an owner can always sell the property. Um, and I mean, we're, we're really talking about folks who have left those houses or we're talking about the heirs of the owner. Um, and, and if it's the heir of the owner, then I think you have some uh, wiggle room there. Um, but that's that's a discussion that has to, the, the most important thing is they need to show up to court because if they show up to court, they can explain why the property is in the condition it's in. And work with the petitioner and the court to try to figure out how the owner can have some um, say in the process and perhaps yeah. seek a settlement. Yeah, most judges will not actually go to a hearing when the owner shows up. They will turn it into a status conference and find out how do we help the owner? What kind of resources can we do, especially if it's a nonprofit, not to have the owner get fixed, but literally you need to go get an attorney and you need to protect yourself because the judge, most judges I've been in front of are very uncomfortable where you have a pro se litigant trying to defend against the statute, right? And and because it's, you don't understand what you're doing. So if they show up, that that's going to be the first step to them getting the relief that they may need uh, to either keep their property or to be dealt with in an equitable manner where they are not disgraced. Chris, I see that you came back on and I know there's a, it's one o'clock. There are other questions in the chat and we, I'll work with Wayne to get answers and get them out as part of the packet um, and do our best to answer the remaining questions. But thank you for everybody participa participating today, especially Wayne, really enjoyed talking with you about this and the Housing Alliance for hosting us. Absolutely, thank you so much everybody for continuing the great work and trying to make sure that our neighborhoods look and live and are the best that they can be. Thank you, Winnie and Wayne. This was a great session. Thank you all for joining. Um, we'll send out the answers to the questions along with the slides and the recordings within a week of this webinar. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks, Chris.